Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about a brief history of the theory of evolution. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, we want to quickly discuss what is a theory. Well, you know, what it means in everyday non-scientific language is, is that it's generally viewed as a hunch or a guess to a, to a question. For instance, here we have a, a group of people sitting around maybe discussing a book. And here we have a guy who says, I have a theory about the author's intent. Well, this man is really about to share his interpretation of a book. You know, another person in this book group may have a very different interpretation. This man's not really about to share a science theory. But the way he's using the word theory is kind of causing some misleading problems when we talk about theories in science. Because in science, theories are created after years of experimentations and years of observations. They are a large body of information created after experiments and observations. You know, for example, the germ theory basically states that many diseases are caused by the presence and actions of microorganisms. That's not a hunch. That's not a guess. A guess. Uh, germ theory is a scientific theory created after years and years of experimentation and observations. Another example of a scientific theory would be the cell theory, you know, of, of many parts of the cell theory, but one of the more basic parts of the cell theory says that cells are the basic units of life. That's not a hunch. That's not a guess. Saying that cells are the basic units of life, well, that's been created after years of experimentation and observation. The theory of plate tectonics, that the crust of the earth is broken into these moving fragments, again, that, that's not a hunch. That's not a guess. That is a large body of information created after years of experimentation and observation. And so one thing to stress is that theories are based on testable evidence, testable, observable evidence based on the natural world. You know, for reasons like this, you know, we've eliminated, you know, fortune telling and, you know, reading cards and predicting the future. These are not sciences because they're not based on testable evidence. You know, palm reading, again, not, uh, not science. It's just not based on any testable evidence. And neither, you know, reading your horoscope and the signs of the zodiac. You know, people may look to their horoscope maybe as, uh, as, as guidance or entertainment, but by no means are these scientific um, uh, uh, theories. So one thing also to mention about a theory is that they have stood the test of time. They have withstood years of experimentation and observation and even withstood perhaps years of criticism. And for a science theory to still be valid, that's, pretty, that's a pretty strong statement in it, in it being a valid scientific argument. Well, here we have a person saying, I don't believe in evolution. After all, it's just a theory. You know, when, when this argument is made, they are using the word theory as if a theory is a hunch or a guess. But that's really not the, gen that's not the meaning of the word theory in science. If we apply the definition of theory to this man's sentence, he's really saying, I don't believe in evolution. After all, it's a well-substantiated explanation of the natural world based on a body of facts that have been repeatedly confirmed through experimentation and observation. When you put it in this sense, you know, his, his argument use, loses a lot of validity. So we need to understand what a theory is. It is by no means a hunch or a guess. So if we transition now into, you know, some of the early work that was done leading up to where we are now, you know, let's look at Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. He uh, develops this theory called acquired inheritance. Now I say it's an early theory because today by no means is this an acceptable scientific theory here. But at the time it was uh, believed that traits acquired during an organism's lifetime could be passed on to their offspring. And as Lamarck explained acquired inheritance, you know, one of the more common examples he used was the evolution of how giraffes got such a long neck. He argued that there were short-necked ancestors and that in their struggle to reach the treetops in order to get leaves for food, that they began to stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch their necks until we see uh, the, the length that we have today. And then he argued that that extra stretchy neck would be passed on to their offspring every time they reproduce. Well, I hope you see why this is a wrong 
uh, this was a wrong theory back in its day. Because today we know that traits, that only traits linked to our DNA can be passed on to offspring. And so if a, if a person would to have a shorter neck and they were to reproduce, there's a really good chance their children would have shorter necks. It's not, you're not able to stretch your body and then pass that extra stretchiness onto your offspring. That's not how the process works. Uh, and so here's a real simple example of acquired inheritance. You know, here we have a, a, have a gentleman named Jacob. And Jacob was just involved in a serious car accident, and he lost his left arm. You know, he's recovered, years go by, and he's, he wants to have future children, him and his wife. Will his children have only one arm? Of course not. Uh, but this would be acquired inheritance. If his children were born with only one arm, well, that would support acquired inheritance. But knowing that his children would be born with two arms, this would, of course, dispel and discredit acquired inheritance. But we still talk acquired inheritance because it's step towards where we are today. And so where we are today, uh, we, we can trace uh, our, our understanding of evolution and natural selection to this gentleman, Charles Darwin. And what he did was he observed that organisms have little differences, little variations based upon their environment that they lived within. And you might know that he went on a five-year boat ride and along the journey they stopped at the Galapagos Islands and he examined wildlife and collected samples and specimens and brought them back to England for further analysis. And one of the more famous, exper uh, famous observations uh, centered around the finches on the Galapagos Islands. He noticed that they had different shapes of beaks when he went on one island versus another island versus another island. For instance, uh, he noticed that the, uh, this large beak was uh, common on islands where there were lots of nuts to eat. So the large beak would be helpful in cracking open the nuts so they could eat the food on the inside. And he noticed that this beak was common on islands where there were smaller and softer seeds. And he noticed that this beak was common to islands that had small seeds, fruits, and insects to feed upon. And he noticed that this beak was more common when, uh, on to islands that had insects and spiders. So he noticed that there were little variations in the beaks and, the, and that these variations provided the finches, the birds, with advantages depending on where, what island they lived upon. And so eventually he publishes uh, one of the uh, most influential science books, The Origin of Species. And in this book, he outlines the process and explains how natural selection, uh, he believed, worked. And it's the process where organisms with favorable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. So here's a bunch of badly drawn giraffes. And, you know, notice how there's some leaves above their head. Well, so how did giraffes get a long neck? Did they stretch themselves like Lamarck argued? No. What they did was they reproduced with one another. So the giraffe ancestors, they all had little differences, just like today. Not every giraffe today has exactly the same size neck. There's little variations. And so notice how some of my giraffes in this picture here have a little longer neck than others. Some have a little shorter neck than others. And so those that had a slightly longer neck had a better chance to survive. They're able to reach the leaves. And those with the slightly shorter neck just died. And so now the survivors, maybe that's a male and that's a female, so now when they reproduced and they passed their beneficial longer neck onto the next generation, their babies and their babies and their babies and their babies. And, their babies. and over time, the longer neck became a common trait simply because of natural selection. Having a long neck provided an advantage. And this uh, natural selection, the theory, was first outlined in 1859 when Darwin published The Origin of Species, one of the most, if not the most influential science book uh, ever written, which really started us down this journey of trying to understand how life has evolved over the years. So I want to mention the difference between an adaptation versus a variation. Well, a variation is just a difference, an inherited trait that makes one individual different from another. You know, in a group of 30 people, 
you can see little differences in height, in hairstyle, and eye color, and so we all have little variations. And, you know, when he looked at the Galapagos uh, tortoises, as he's on the Galapagos Islands, he examines the tortoises, and he noticed that the shell shape, the, the shell of the tortoise differed depending upon the environment. For instance, uh, tortoises on this island right here had a dome-shaped shell, but tortoises on this island had a large notch. Well, he noticed that that large notch allowed them to lift their heads to greater height because these tortoises lived on islands where there was very little vegetation growing on the ground. So it, they had to reach their heads higher in order to feed on some of the overhanging branches and leaves. And so this little variation of having the notch uh, would, would be a great example of the next definition of an adaptation. Having the notch in its shell provided it with an advantage and therefore it could reach food, it would survive better and therefore reproduce better and pass on this advantage. So an adaptation is a variation but one that increases or enhances the chance of survival. And so we look at some other adaptations. Well the white fur of this polar bear is an adaptation. It allows it to blend into its snowy environment. It can sneak up better on seals and other prey so it could capture food. You know, here we have a great example of an adaptation. Here's an insect that resembles the appearance of a leaf. This is a wonderful adaptation if you're the insect because it helps to improve your chances of surviving. You know, birds and reptiles, reptiles may not be uh, as able to see you. And it's not just animals, you know, here's a plant adaptation, you know, thorns are an adaptation that some plants have developed to prevent herbivores from feeding upon them. And here's a, a caterpillar that resembles bird poop. This is a really funny adaptation because, again, if you're a bird, you probably don't want to eat what you think is bird poop, and you're more likely to pass this caterpillar up and look for food elsewhere. So it's kind of a silly, fun little adaptation to close this out today. And so there you have it, a, a really brief introduction of the history behind the theory of evolution. If you're in my biology class, maybe try these questions, write them on a separate sheet of paper, and I'd be happy to check your answers before school or after school. Thanks for watching.